Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Space Warfighter Talks. I'm your host, Bill Wolf, the president and founder of the Space Force Association. We are honored today to talk to Colonel Rhett Turnbull, the director of cross-mission ground and communications enterprise at U.S. Air Force. Now, sir, before we get going, is it still U.S. Air Force or did the, did the uh, uniform switch? Yeah, it's, it's uh, still uh, U.S. Air Force uh, for now, but it's on Velcro, ready to go as, as soon as we get uh, uh, the congressional approval of the scrolls. Um, I think we chatted briefly about that last time, but we're, we're still waiting for the field grade officers to get scrolled over. Um, so as soon as that happens, I'll switch over, but uh, Air Force for now. Okay, sir. Thank you. I just wanted to provide an update uh, since the last time we spoke. And yes, as you said, there we, we conducted an interview just a couple months ago. So if you haven't had a chance already to get some background about all the important work that you're doing over there to our audience, go take a look at ussfa.org and log in to view that interview uh, because it does provide a really good background of everything and all the good work you guys are doing. So thanks again, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know how busy you are to talk with us about all the exciting work that's going on. Yeah, Bill, happy to be here. And, and let's get right into it, sir, if it's okay. Uh, the first thing that I wanna talk about is what's happening in joint all domain. And for folks who don't know what, what that means is space is a critical component to the joint all domain mission. And when we say joint all domain, really what we're talking about is air, land, maritime, cyber, and space. So you can't have joint all domain superiority without first and, and continuing to have space superiority. So I'm excited to talk about joint all domain command and control or JADC2. And so recently the US Secretary of Defense has signed off on one of the biggest changes to how the military will fight future wars, approving the joint all domain command and control strategy that aims to connect sensors from all of its military services onto a single network. How does ECX support or enable execution of this strategy? Yeah, Bill, thanks. Yeah, we're, we are right in the middle of that um, as we support Space Force. Uh, as you said, space is one of those domains we're trying to connect. Um, and you know, for, for, for the listeners out there that may, may not be familiar with JADC2, it's really about um, how do we integrate uh, all of the domains and all the data and information that's flowing through those domains so that we can make decisions um, that, that across uh, every single one of those domains. Uh, for example, uh, it's not, you know, it's not just a land fight or a sea fight or air fight or a space fight. It's just a fight. And, and we've got to be able to use each other's data, use each other's sensors and use each other's weapons um, uh, to close the kill chain uh, in this sort of this concept of join all domains C2. To do that, there's a few things, for, at least for, from my perspective, how I break down the problem. Um, first, you've got to expose the data. You've got to be able to actually get the data from all those sensors. You've got to then be able to move the data, get that data to where it needs to go, and, and get it to the right the get it to the right shooter, get it to the right C2 center, so that you can make a decision about that data. And then you've got to be able to exploit that data. What's the data telling you? Um, fuse it with other data from other domains, um, and be able to make a decision or close the kill chain. And so ECX is working uh, across that entire um, spectrum uh, to achieve all domain C2 uh, uh, and help Space Force do that. Um, just as an example, expose the data. I think we talked last time a little bit about Unified Data Library and some of the things we're doing there. We've got a number, number of efforts there. How do we expose the data so that everybody has access to it? The UDL, the Unified Data Library, is, is one way that Space Force is getting data from a number of different sensors um, it started out as a space domain awareness thing. How do we get all of our space domain awareness data in one place? Um, and it's not just our data, but we've got a lot of commercial vendors who are providing their data into the UDL as well so that we can pay for access to that data and exploit that data alongside the data from our own sensors. But we're bringing in a, a lot of data from other domains as well. We've got cyber data, air data, um, uh, other kinds of space data, uh, data from the Intel community, all going into the Unified Data Library that now it's all in one place, uh, and then you can expose that to the rest of the enterprise to use. Um, so that's one piece of it. Another piece is, hey, once you've got that data in the, in the Unified Data Library, you've got to be able to uh, move it around and uh, in some cases, clean it up, calibrate it, um, you know, be able to compare apples to apples. Uh, so we have something that we call data as a service. 
Um, our, you know, our code name for it is Warp Core, and we'll, we can certainly talk more about that later. But, but that's, a, that's using some commercial technologies to be able to uh, clean that data, massage it, combine data from different data sources, and then move that data around in the enterprise where it needs to go. And then the final piece is how do you exploit the data? And we have a number of different applications that are doing that, that are pulling the data uh, from a number of different data sources um, through the UDL, pulling it through Warp Core, combining it with data from other domains, and then those applications are exploiting that data to provide effects for the warfighter. And we're doing that across a number of different areas, space domain awareness, um, the electromagnetic spectrum, um, you know, uh, space support uh, to theater, theater effects um, from space, um, those kinds of things where we, we've got applications which are pulling data um, from all the different domains, uh, expo exploiting it, and then providing some capability back to the warfighter. I'll give you just one example of, of something we did recently uh, with, a, with two different domains, the air domain and the space domain, is we this the AOC, the Air Operations Center, have got uh, an air tasking order that they use to coordinate what's going on across the air domain. And we have something uh, on the space side called the Combined Space Tasking Order, or the CSTO, that's very similar. Um, both because of the way that we've architected this so that we are exposing the data from uh, those applications which produce those tasking orders um, through common interfaces. Uh, we call them APIs, application programming interfaces, and making that data widely available. Uh, we were able to take the data from both the air, air side and the space side and combine it together to really produce what the first joint tasking order and expose that into uh, the Air Operations Center. And so they've got space and air domain data all in one place on one screen, one piece of glass uh, combined together. And that, was, that took our engineers uh, a couple of weeks to do. Uh, it was a relatively easy thing to do because of the way that we're exposing the data, um, providing the ability to move that data across the enterprise, and then providing common um, interfaces to be able to exploit the data. And, and we're doing that kind of thing more and more uh, at, uh, across the enterprise. And I think you'll see space, um, which is so central to everything that we do across the joint fight, is right in the middle of JADC2 uh, as we build out more capabilities like that. Sir, that, that's a lot. And, you know, growing up in the Air Force and realizing the importance and criticality of space, that was one of the big discussions and questions we had from the other domains is, one, how do you define what it is the space that the space domain is doing in support of the joint fight, you know, understanding that? And then two, how do you coordinate effects? You know, how do you coordinate what it is the space domain is doing in support of all the other domains so that each domain knows exactly what each is bringing to the fight. So you can start to identify those capability gaps. And once those uh, capability gaps are identified, you can start to fill them with critical capabilities. Uh, so, sir, that's, that's tremendous what's being done. And I know we're going to talk about a little bit more about examples here in just a moment, uh, but that's a good vignette that you, you describe. On February 18th, uh, Space and Missile Systems Center issued a RPP for a scalable, resilient, and cyber secure mission data network. Can you share more on what this effort will support? And can you share your role in the Mesh 1T effort? And how does this relate to the department's ABMS efforts? Great. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. That, yeah, we, we're really excited about Mesh 1T, which is the, the effort you're referring to there. Um, the, the, the one, uh, for those who have been following along with the uh, ABMS, um, the Advanced Battle Management System. Uh, there were a number of one efforts early on. Some of them are, are changing names now as the, as the program um, matures a little bit and, and uh, solidifies exactly what the strategy is going to be for some of these different uh, mission areas. Um, but, but right now we're sticking with Mesh 1. The T is for terrestrial. And so it's, what, it, what it really is is about how do we um, provide a scale, scalable, resilient, cyber secure network that connects all of our terrestrial systems. Um, we started early on that this was one of the pathfinders that ABMS said, hey, this is something we, we need to go to. We've got to be able to connect all of these sensors. And, and you've got to, to do that. You've got to have a network that can move the data around, the network that's resilient, that's scalable, um, you know, that, that works in places where you maybe don't have your traditional um, network capability. It's got to be able to connect, um, you know, aircraft to, to spacecraft, to the ground, to to, to um you know, ships out at sea and, and connect all of those things together if you're going to really uh, achieve this joint all-domain C2 vision. Um, 
we realized right away in Space Force that that was something that we really needed. It was, it was scratching an itch that we had, particularly on our terrestrial networks. How do we connect all of our ground nodes, um, both our, you know, all our sensors, our, our C2 systems uh, that command and control our satellites, and then, and then the operational C2 nodes will all need to be connected. And many of those systems today are connected with um, what, I'll, for, what I'll call legacy systems, right? A fairly, uh, wouldn't call them resilient, wouldn't call them cyber secure. Um, and, and uh, definitely, in many cases, not very high bandwidth. Um, and, and, and so, frankly, they're limiting, right? And so we wanted to modernize that. And so we saw what ABMS was doing, uh, said that there's a lot of potential there to really help out the Space Force. And frankly, we said, let's, we'll lead. Let Space Force lead this effort. Um, we're, we'll go tackle this terrestrial piece of the Mesh One network. There are other components of that connecting the air domain um, et cetera, that we'll eventually link into. Uh, but with this, this uh, request for prototype proposal you mentioned is to build out a prototype and a pathfinder over the next 12 months uh, for this Mesh One terrestrial network. And what we're trying to do there is use commercial technologies, really provides, you know, network as a service um, that will connect all of our, our key nodes using commercial best practices. Let the people who really know how to do this kind of mesh networking go out and figure out how to do it and then provide that back to us rather than dictate exactly how it's gonna get done. Um, and some of the key things we're looking for there are uh, scalability. How are we gonna be able to scale this out if, it's, if the Pathfinder is successful? Resiliency, uh, how do we make sure that we have resilient links that, that you know, one uh, you know, well-placed backhoe or uh, fishing trawler can't take out your entire network, um, right? And that you've got resilient links, you've got path diversity, um, we've got the ability uh, to uh, move data around regardless of what's happening um, in the electromagnetic spectrum or what's happening to our networks. Um, and so I'm really excited about this Pathfinder. Um, and one of the interesting things about how we're doing this is instead of going off and building a, a coming up with a law requirements document and, and, and going out to industry and saying, okay, go build this thing. Uh, we came out with, with you know, relatively what, what I'll call lightweight requirements. Um, gave those to industry and said, we want your ideas for how to go prototype this. We don't have all the answers right now for what exactly we need, how exactly to go build it, how we're going to operate it. And so um, we put it out there to industry to say, bring us your ideas. Um, and, and we got a really great response. Uh, we're going through uh, the source selection now, so I can't talk you know, any more specifics about that. Um, but I'll just say the response was, was phenomenal. Uh, uh, I'm excited by... Uh, the interest the industry has shown here, and uh, we'll, what we'll get on contract is a prototype, and we'll, we'll get to try it out, build something out in a year or so, a year from now, we'll actually have something operational, and then we'll be able to test it out um, and you know, really test our hypotheses on the requirements. Were we right? Did we miss something? Do we need to tweak it, adjust it? Uh, and then we'll have options built in to scale that uh, if uh, the prototype works out. So I'm really excited about um, both the capability, but also the strategy for how we decided to go acquire the capability. I think it'll let us get the, the best ideas the industry's got, and it'll let us get something out into the field very, very quickly. Sir, sure, thank you for that. Yeah, you did mention, of course, the Advanced Battle Management System, which is the Air Force's arm, or really the DOD's way to implement the JADC2 construct, which I think is extremely important. I know folks are uh, I'm sure they're going to have questions about the, the pace and the schedule of the ABMS efforts. Can you talk at all about um, how that schedule is going to be implemented so you can uh, create the capability, the technology, and then demonstrate it and then provide feedback for the next ABMS effort? Is, there, is it going to be sequenced such that you can get that feedback and, and quickly refine uh, technology to support? Uh, or if you can't talk about it, completely understand. Yeah, um, Bill, uh, on ABMS specifically, I'll defer to the uh, Air Force RCO, Department of the Air okay. Force Rapid Capabilities yep. Office, um, who is leading that effort now, um, and would recommend, uh, you know, it'd be, they'd be great for you to talk to as well about yep. what their overall strategy is for ABMS. I will tell you that we're very tightly lashed to them. Um, you know, I, for example, I, I speak to my counterpart uh, uh, there weekly about the, the various efforts that they've got going on and how the things that we do mesh into that. Uh, and so Mesh One Terrestrial is one of those things. 
their flight following what we do is, as I mentioned, Space Force is sort of leading the way here. Um, uh, but I, I'm certain we'll be successful uh, with Mesh One Terrestrial. Uh, and so the next logical step there is how do we tie that into the other things that ABMS is doing um, with regards to connecting the air domain, uh, connecting um, you know the other domains uh, into this Mesh One network, and how do we ultimately have a, a a network that connects any sensor to any shooter anywhere, any domain, right? I mean, I think that's that's the overall vision for JAD C two. Um, so, but we're not biting all that off at once. We're starting with things you know like building out the Mesh network for the terrestrial. There are some things going on right now to uh, connect experiment with how do we connect the air domain better and then the next logical step would be how do we connect those things together there as well and we're also doing space force is doing some work on hey how do we connect the space layer together um, how do we start building out a mesh network in space and so as you can envision as we build out these networks you start to connect space to air to terrestrial to sea and now you've got everything connected um, and so we're, we're we're doing those efforts in parallel and eventually i think they'll all just come together Yes, sir. No, I appreciate that. And uh, you're right. If you create the ecosystem uh, and you demonstrate the capacity for the ecosystem, the resilience of it, like you're talking about, and then people can't help but to get on board with what that ecosystem is. And Mesh 1T, like you're describing, is exactly that. You did talk about the Unified Data Library. I, I can't help because we did uh, interview General Kreider not too, not too long ago to talk about the Space Force as a digital service, which I think is phenomenal. Uh, great interview with her. And she talks a little bit about this as well. How important is data or data standards to folks who are trying to integrate into a data repository uh, like the UDL? Uh, and this might just be uh, a concept discussion or, or you know, I, I'm just curious if you can talk about that at all. Yeah, I think, um, so data standards are definitely important, um, but from my perspective, it's, it's more important to understand what the data is yeah. than just to, to uh, dictate a standard that everybody follows. Right. Right. Uh, and so, um, and, and one of the things I try to be very careful about is, is, making, is, is really staying humble in all of this, right? We yeah. don't have all the answers. Um, and so I don't think, that uh, we are in a position to dictate the standards to everybody because one, uh, that limits innovation and, and it also presumes that we know exactly what data we're gonna need and how we're gonna use it. Um, what we do wanna have is be able to make sure that we understand the data that we've got. And so there are some standards, um, for example, for how do we get the data into the Unified Data Library? We're using commercial uh, best practices there for how do you get that data into the library um, and then how do you get the data out of the library um, using things like RESTful uh, APIs, application programming interfaces, uh, JSON, which is an industry standard for how you um, transfer data from one application to the other. And, and by leveraging those commercial standards um, then and making sure that we document what the data is, uh, and, and that's something called a data dictionary that, that documents what data you have and what format it's in, um, you can then get the... It, it, it doesn't become so important on that you're using the exact same standard as I am, as long as we both understand each other's standards. And that's right. where things like Warp Core, that data as a service layer I talked about come in, is one of the things we're able to do with Warp Core is pull in data from a lot of different systems, you, perhaps using different standards. Um, for example, think about space domain awareness data, right? Two different vendors providing us space domain awareness data could use two different reference frames. They could use different calibration um, criteria, right? But we need to understand that, and we do understand that for everything that's in the UDL. The data as a service layer allows us to pull those two different data sets in and then transform them so that they're both in the same reference frame, for example. That's just one example, right? And then provide that sort of cleaned up uh, data to the other applications further downstream that need that data. Um, and then eventually put that data back in the unified data library, sort of value added data that we, we merge and fuse different data sets, clean them up, uh, calibrate them, weed out any bad data, or uh, and then put that data back in the UDL so that people can use it. So it, you, you need the whole ecosystem. It's not just enough to have the data in one place, but you need to be able to understand what format that is the data in, um, understand various uh, 
qualities about the data and then have some way to massage that data, get it into the right format uh, for whatever application you need uh, and move it around the enterprise. And that's, what, that's why we've paired the UDL with this data as a service layer to allow us to do that. Yes, sir. No, extremely important for sure. And for folks interested in the UDL, they can just go over to unifieddatalibrary.com, sign up, get an account, and start to look at what the UDL is providing. Additionally, I believe there are monthly outreach opportunities where folks can dial in and learn more about the Unified Data Library. So thank you, sir, for providing that background. And talking about data as a service, you recently awarded a contract to Palantir for data as a service. Can you share how ECX is transforming the new data environment and how does this effort relate to the Atlas effort and the decommissioning of SPADOC? Okay, thanks, Bill. Yeah, a lot there. Um, uh, with, with SPADOC, Atlas, uh, uh, data as a service, so, um, uh, I'll, I'll try, to, try to hit all those things. Right. Um, so first on the, on the warp core, uh, the, is the, which is the Palantir effort you mentioned, um, we started that as a, as a prototype. Uh, that we did on the, uh, the spec OTA, the other transaction um, agreements that we, a contract we did uh, last year as a prototype. Um, yeah. It proved out to be wildly successful. Uh, and so we awarded a, a follow on um, to Palantir. It's really, a, it's a uh, implementation of their commercial foundry product, um, which we've uh, taken and, and, and adapted for use with Space Force. Um, and that's what's allowing us to connect to the UDL and a lot of other data sources, because not everything is in the UDL yet, although that is our goal. Today, there are some legacy data sources that aren't there. Um, using the technology that Palantir has, we're able to connect all those disparate data sources, bring the data in, um, transform that data in whatever way we need to transform it, and then move it to whatever application needs it, and then eventually just feed it back into the UDL. And so it's, it's proven out to be a really powerful capability allowing us to do that and, and get up and running very, very quickly with a lot of different data sources. Um, in fact, uh, although we, the initial work was specifically focused on space force and space domain awareness data, the number of our applications did, um, one, we found that once we got all those different uh, data sources connected, that we had a lot of other customers um, back to the sort of the all domain concepts that, hey, I would like to get some of that data. Um, and, and, and so we're supporting uh, NORAD, Northcom, uh, and a number of other uh, customers who aren't specifically focused on space, but, but want access to that data um, at, and, and the capabilities that uh, WarpCore provides. Um, and so really excited about the, the work there. Um, we are working on a, uh, a, a large follow-on IDIQ, uh, most likely, uh, type contract so that we can have uh, multiple different options for doing that kind of work um, in, in the long term. Uh, this follow along with uh, Palantir was a sort of a stopgap measure to say, hey, uh, the, the prototype was really successful. We want to keep this going and mature it, um, but we are going to go back out to industry um, to, to awards a, a bigger follow on contract eventually. So um, something definitely to, to keep an eye out for, for those folks that are interested in that kind of thing. Um, you, you mentioned Atlas. Um, and uh, how, how it relates. So Atlas is one of the systems that uh, Warp Core supports. Um, for those that aren't familiar with Atlas, that is the replacement for the SPADOC system. The SPADOC system is a legacy system that operates today um, to pr process all of the, the uh, space domain awareness data that's coming off um, uh, the uh, space surveillance network. And, and then turn that into useful space domain awareness data. Um, it's a legacy system uh, that's been around a long time. Uh, there have been a number of attempts to uh, replace it. Uh, and it's, uh, frankly, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard problem because it does a lot of complex work. Um, and it's been a challenge to get it replaced. Um, Atlas is on track to do that. Atlas will be the program that eventually does that. Uh, one of the things that you need to do that mission is you need access to a lot of different data from different sources. And some of those today come in through, you know, one particular pipe into one particular computer system, um, you know, at the 18th Space Control Squadron, for example. Implementing something like Warp Core allows us to provide more of a enterprise approach to tapping into those data sources um, and then getting them that massaging the data and getting it to where it needs to go so Atlas can process it. So I think it'll, from a data perspective, uh, Warp Core will help Atlas uh, out uh, considerably by just making the data available to Atlas. Um, and then taking the data that Atlas 
um, produces and getting that back into the Unified Data Library. Um, one of the things I do want to mention a little bit about, about the work that we're doing on Atlas um, is, you know, I, I did mention some of the challenges that we've had uh, in the past trying to get that system replaced. Um, and it, and it, a lot of reasons for that, but, but, but it can boil down to one of the primary reasons is it's a very complex system that does a lot of complex processing. Uh, and, it's, it, and it's something we absolutely have to get right. And in the past, we've tried to replace a big complex system with another big complex system um, in one fell swoop, right? And, uh, and that's a really hard thing to do. Right. Um, and so what we're doing today is, is a much different approach. It's a much more modern approach to how we develop software. And, and what we've done is basically decompose all the different things that Atlas will need to do to fully replace Spadoc into small um, bite-sized chunks. We call them microservices. Mm -hmm. and, what's and what's happening over time is those microservices get delivered um, incrementally. Yeah. And, it, and eventually, um, the, the capability that Spadoc is doing gets transitioned to those microservices bit by bit. And then until the end, where you deliver the last microservice, nobody ever even realizes that, that Spadoc disappears because it's, it's just seamlessly transitions. There's not a big sort of a big bang effect where you turn the system off and you turn the new system on. Right. Um, it, we're, in, the, in industry, they call this a strangler pattern. And what you're doing is basically strangling out the old capability yep. little bit by little bit, right? And so what will happen is the operators um, who are using Spadoc won't even realize that, that much of the capability that they were depending on Spadoc uh, doing is being done by Atlas in the background bit by bit by bit until we just eventually turn the whole thing off. And so um, uh, still a lot of work to go do on that, but we've made some really tremendous progress there um, and uh, had, uh, have gotten uh, feedback from the operators um, on uh, sort of what their priorities are, what the, what, what, which of those microservices we need to tackle first um, and uh, making really good progress there. And one example of, of why this uh, approach is a really good way to develop software is it allows us to be really flexible and agile. Um, for example, one of the things that the, the space operators at the 18th Space Control Squadron said they really need is the ability to process um, these large LEO constellations that are being launched, right? The, the initial launch processing, uh, like these Starlink launches, right? You've got right. 60 brand new things out there and the system's got to track and develop initial orbits for those. Um, the current system just isn't designed for those really large constellations. Uh, and so they wanted some capability to do that much more quickly. That was planned for Atlas all along. That's one of our requirements for the system, but it wasn't planned until next year. And we, you said, you know what? We could develop that microservice now, pulled it to the left an entire year, um, no schedule impact to the overall schedule, no cost impact, because we're really just saying this Lego block that we're going to build later, we're going to build it early and, and, and move some of the other things later on. And we were able to react very, very quickly to get that capability out um, relatively quickly. And so um, I'm really excited by the flexibility that this approach um, gives us. And, um, you know, I am I'm very much looking forward to getting Spadoc replaced um, in, uh, later on in 2022, as I know uh, many of our space operators are. Yes, sir. That was going to be one of the questions I was going to ask is about how easy the new architecture is going to be for the space operator to, to utilize. And you answered that. So I do appreciate that. We've got a question coming in from the audience. And if you can answer it, great. If you can't completely understand, can you share the results of the market research for your ECX, SE&I, RFI responses? We, industry is basically saying that they know that you want an SE&I support yesterday. And they're wondering how they can help. Yeah, um, I, I can't share the results yet. The team, I, I haven't gotten those back from the team. I, we did do an RFI um, and got some great feedback from industry. And I'm waiting to hear back from my team on sort of where we are and talk about the next steps there. But for, for all the industry that responded, um, let me just say thank you. Really, really appreciate your input. I know, I know we've talked to many of you um, over the last few months. Um, I know many of you, many more took time uh, to, to respond to the RFI. And so I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so the bottom line is we do need uh, some additional SCNI support really focused on modernizing the ground infrastructure. And when we set up our organization, uh, as we talked about uh, last time, Bill, just a couple of mm -hmm. years ago, um, we didn't have that uh, ground focused SCNI support in place that really was focused across the entire ground enterprise. And then 
and really how do we integrate all of these different capabilities that we're trying to integrate. Um, I know the industry's got the capability to do that. And so we're looking forward to um, getting on contract uh, you, soon. I'll just say soon uh, to be able to do that over. And, you know, thank you. People always ask, you know, how can we reach out to you if we've got questions or comments? Is there a way for folks to reach out to you specifically uh, if they've got some um, information to share with you? Yeah, so the easiest way to reach me is uh, actually connect with me through LinkedIn and send me a LinkedIn message. Uh, and what I'll do then is connect you with my team to, you know, to set up a, a, a time to chat. If you send me an email, um, well, it'll be just one more email in the inbox. And I got a lot of those. Um, I will give you, I'll, 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 I'll give you my email address right now um, for folks that do want to connect that way. And that's Wallace, W-A-L-L-A-C-E dot Turnbull. T as in Tango, U R N as in November, B as in Bravo, U L L at spaceforce.mil. So happy to connect that way. Um, but I get a lot of email, uh, right. and if you if you connect with me uh, through LinkedIn, um, you're much more likely to get a, a more timely response. So happy to connect that way. Thank you, sir. You know, we recently had an opportunity to interview two of your best and brightest on the next Hackasat event. Can you share more on ECX's role in ensuring robust cybersecurity for the space ground enterprise? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, so it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that cybersecurity is a growth area for sure, right? Um, we, we've seen what's going on in the industry, um, the, you know, the ransomware event that we had in this country with, with the, the pipeline shut down uh, not too long ago, the new executive order on cybersecurity, um, which everybody needs to be paying attention to. If you haven't read that, I recommend you go whitehouse.gov and download it and read it. Um, some really important changes there um, for, uh, for anybody that wants to work with the federal government and, and cybersecurity. So definitely a growth area, um, but one that we've been paying attention to for a long time. Um, the, the, the priorities that we have on cyber um, are two, sort of twofold. One is protect the legacy systems. Um, and, and many of those systems, frankly, were built uh, and fielded in a time then when we really didn't think that hard about cybersecurity. Right. And, and so we know that many of those systems uh, you know, lack some of the, the basic cyber protections that we would, we would put in if we were building today. And so one of our programs, DCOS, or Defensive Cyber Operations for Space, does exactly that. Um, we've got uh, a team uh, in Colorado Springs that's using um, agile DevSecOps software development paired with cyber expertise to rapidly field new cyber defensive capabilities and get those out into the field uh, and defend um, the legacy systems. The systems are already fielded today. And today we've got uh, the, that DCO capability fielded across three different locations, protecting um, quite a few, uh, more than a half dozen of our uh, existing mission systems. Um, and, and those are constantly being updated. One thing in cyber is, right, you, you can't sit still. You've got to constantly right. be moving because the threat's constantly uh, evolving. And so we're, we're feeling that capability. That same capability will be used for the Hackasat um, program that you mentioned, right? We'll, we will um, be able to protect um, and, and monitor and detect what's going on uh, as the hackers are trying to get into our satellite. We did that last year, for example, um, when we did the first Hackasat, and we were able to develop 20 new uh TTPs, uh, uh, techniques, tactics, and procedures, um, watching the world's best hackers try to attack our space systems, roll those into new cyber capabilities, and then, and then in a matter of days, get those back out into the field to protect our actual systems. And so that's one of the big things we get out of events like Hackasat is we, we get to evolve those TTPs, understand what the, what the threat actors uh, might be doing, and then making sure our systems can respond. The, the second big thrust uh, in addition to protecting our legacy systems, is make sure that cyber is baked in from the yeah. beginning for everything that we're doing now. And so every every system that uh, ECX is building today uh, or in the in, in the process of developing, we bake cyber in from the get-go. Uh, for example, our enterprise ground services, EGS, which will provide the tactical C2 um, for uh, all of our space systems, has that DCO capability baked in. So it's not something that we have to go um, bolt on later. Um, as we're doing now for some of the legacy systems. Um, Forge, which will do the mission data processing uh, for the missile warning mission, um, it is another example, has um, a lot of state-of-the-art cyber requirements baked in from the beginning um, so that, that it is cyber secure 
out of the box. Um, and so, um, that's, you know, that, that, that's basically what we're going to do with everything that we buy from now on is, is we're going to look at cybersecurity. It's going to have to be baked in, um, you know, the, for example, the platforms which we're deploying uh, our software operations on have got um, those basic cyber controls baked in, um, it, you know, moving to things like zero trust architectures, where you uh, assume that, that the bad guy's already gotten in and still make sure that they can't move around inside your network. Right and limit the damage they can do. Um, those kinds of things we're gonna we're gonna approach uh, for everything that we build. Yes, sir. I tell you, having it baked in. That's exactly what General Kreider was saying too. Is it, as we as you all um, buy new technology, it's imperative to ensure that the cybersecurity aspect of it is thought about at the inception of the technological development and not an afterthought. Uh, where to your point, it's susceptible to adversary activities. So. That's a, that's a perfect message for folks to understand. And setting up the testing and, and then developing the TTPs, as you mentioned, is, is as important as the continued development evolution of the technology. So, uh, sir, great words. Sir, I really do appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. And if it's okay with you, uh, we'll just keep, keep having these dialogues every couple of months and just get updates from you on what's happening in the, in the, uh, you know, in the acquisition world and the important work that you're doing. Any closing comments from you, sir? Yeah, Bill, thanks. Yeah, first of all, happy to do that. I appreciate the conversation. Um, and uh, yeah, def definitely happy to do that. Um, and you know, I think this, this dialogue is important. It's important for uh, our stakeholders, for your, the Space Force Association members, uh, people who really care about Space Force and where we're going to understand uh, sort of where we're headed, um, what our priorities are. Um, and so I, you know, I really value that conversation. Um, and, and I know many of, you, many of your members and, and the people watching are also industry members. And it's important to, for them to understand where our priorities are, but also for us to understand sort of what industry can bring, right? We were talking just now about cyber. That's an area where it's constantly evolving. And so I know um, we've had a number of, of different companies that have some really innovative ideas there for how we can um, do cyber better or, mm -hmm. or cover down on maybe some of the, the areas where we, we've got gaps today. Um, love to have those conversations. Um, bring us your ideas. Um, we obviously can't invest in every single one, um, but right. we are definitely interested in having that conversation and really understanding um, what the state of the art is and how we can use that to um, you know, provide better capability to our Space Force guardians or better protect our Space Force systems. And so I'm definitely happy to continue to have that conversation. Perfect. Thank you, sir. And for our audience out there, we are going to announce our Space Warfighter Industry Nights the first week in October, which to your point, sir, it's an opportunity for industry to bring some of their best practices to our guardians so that they can see what actually is happening in, in industry. And so more to follow on that, that event. And obviously, if your schedule allows, would love to have you at that event as well at the first week in October. Beautiful time to be in Colorado Springs, obviously. Uh, but sir, really do appreciate your time today. Look forward to future discussions and have a great Air Force and Space Force Day. Semper Supra. Semper Supra. Thanks, Bill. Bye now.